warm greetings. My name is Luca Castellani and I am a legal officer in the Secretariat of the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, or ANCITRO. And warm greetings to everyone also on my side. I'm Anna Veneziano, the Deputy Secretary General of the International Institute for the Unification of Private Law, UNIDRA. Uh, warm greetings from The Hague. My name is Ning Zhao and I'm Senior Legal Officer at The Hague Conference on Private International Law, also called the HCCH. ANCITRAL is the core body in the United Nations system for the harmonization and the modernization of international trade law. And as such, has prepared some very important texts in the field of uniform contract law, especially uniform law of sales. I'm here today with my colleagues, Anna Veneziano and Ning Zhao, to discuss the legal guide to uniform instruments in the area of international commercial contracts for the SEDEP course on choice of law. Uh, UNIDRA, as uh, many of you know, is an independent intergovernmental organization based in Rome with 63 member states worldwide, one of them being uh, Paraguay and many in uh, Latin America. Its purpose is to study needs and methods for modernizing, harmonizing and coordinating private and in particular commercial law as between states and group of states and uh, formulate uniform law instruments of various types. And in its almost uh, 100 year history, uh, it has developed uh, numerous instruments, including in the area of international commercial contracts. And this is the area that we will look at today, together with my colleagues from the other two sister organizations. The HCCH is an intergovernmental organization mandated to progressively harmonizing the law of the private international law across the globe. So it deals with jurisdiction, applicable law, recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments, as well as judicial and administrative cooperation in the fields of family law, children law, financial, commercial, and civil procedure law. Today, it's my pleasure to work with colleagues from the other two sister organizations to uh, explain to you the legal guide in which we will have interesting instrument to present today. Today we will uh, briefly touch upon some general information on this legal guide. The legal guide uh, is currently available on the website of the three organizations of ANCITRA, the Hague Conference and UNITRA in the English language and uh, we are in the process of finalizing the other five uh, language versions, the five official languages of the United Nations, which means, of course, also Spanish, and French, Russian, Arabic, and Chinese. After uh, giving a little bit of information on the legal guide, that we all warmly encourage you to, to download and read, of course, uh, to complement uh, this lecture, uh, we will get into the various texts that are discussed in, in the legal guide and briefly touch upon on their content. But in particular, we would like to illustrate how these texts interact and how they are relevant, not only uh, from the perspective of the legal theory, but especially in practice when it comes to drafting, negotiating, concluding, and then performing and sometimes litigating contracts for sale of goods. And in the end, as time will allow, uh, we will uh, make some short considerations of a more general type on the possible future steps of the guide and of uniform contract law. It's up to me to give a little bit of information on where this guide is coming from. This guide actually uh, was uh, first suggested at Ancitro. Uh, what happened is uh, uh, one of the main uh, texts uh, that we will discuss today is the United Nations Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods, or CISG, which was concluded in 1980. Uh, CSG is in force uh, in about 94 states. 
Um, I would say many of them in Latin America, actually, uh, all of Latin American countries, except a few, have adopted the CSG. And Ancitral uh, is very keen on uh, periodically celebrating uh, the, the various anniversaries of the CSG, as the CSG is actually one of the most successful treaties of Ancitral and more generally of international uh, commercial law. So there was a discussion uh, which dates already back to 2015. On the occasion of the 35th uh, anniversary, there was a panel at the commission session, a uh, high level panel. And the comments uh, were the three sister organizations, as Anna said, a conference on and Ancetral, had done uh, very valuable work in the field of uniform contract law but that sometimes it was not very clear how that work was related. It is of course clearer uh, to insiders, but uh, for those who are uh, uh, trying to become familiar, maybe as a student or as a junior lawyers with this uh, complex uh, uh, field of the law, uh, this can be a little bit intimidating. A lot of texts, a lot of intergovernment organizations. And there is an additional level of complexity in some regions that comes from exactly uh, regional uniform texts. Uh, of course, there is an assumption that all of these texts are coherent. And in many, many cases, indeed they are, and they reinforce each other. But the way in which they interact and they reinforce each other, it's uh, not always evident to everyone. So uh, states uh, asked uh, Ancestral to reach out to the two other organizations and uh, with the help of experts uh, to compile this legal guide uh, with some requirements. And eventually, uh, partly because of, of uh, some constraints in resources, it took uh, maybe a little bit of time, but uh, of course, in the end, uh, this was finalized and then it was uh, submitted for comments to the governing bodies of the three organizations. Comments uh, were made, they were taken into account, and then the text uh, was finalized. Now it is available to everyone. I would say that it has been so far not only broadly welcomed, but also praised unanimously. That's why I believe I share a common sentiment in saying that the three of us who were directly involved in this project are a bit proud of sharing this with you today. The legal guide as uh, Luca just briefly mentioned, it covers four key instruments. As you can see from the slides, so it covers CI, the HCCH principles, CISG, limitation convention, and UNIDRA principles. Um, the legal guide provides an introduction to these instruments and a brief summary of them. But the emphasis is specially placed on the complementary nature of these instruments, um, especially when more than one instrument applies to, to a transaction. Thus, by clarifying the relationship among them, the legal guide aims to promote the adoption, use, and uniform interpretation of these instruments, and ultimately promote the establishment um, of a predictable and flexible legal environments for cross-border commercial transactions based on the principle of freedom of contract. Thus, the legal guide is a document prepared jointly by the three um, uh, secretariats to promote uniformity, certainty, and clarity in this area of law. So one question is, uh, who are the addressees of this guide? Who should read this guide? As uh, Ning and Luca said, the guide offers a roadmap in navigating these uniform instruments, and it may be useful for many different readers. First of all, why not parties and their lawyers, those assisting in the negotiations and the drafting of contracts, and also those finding solutions where a dispute arises, but also uh, adjudicators meaning with that uh, arbitrators and judges, of course, but also mediators and other conciliators uh, uh, solving disputes between parties. So the intended result is to enable parties to efficiently and effectively structure their transactions 
in the light of the benefits that are presented by uniform law and the instruments, and also for disputes to be solved in an efficient and effective way. Now we are moving to the second part of the talk today. It's about introduction to the UNCCA, UNIDRA, and the HCCH relevant instrument on choice law. Of course, before starting that, we find it is useful to explain uh, what is private international law versus substantive law, what is hard law and uh, soft law. So for that, very briefly, um, we can say substantive law is created of defines rights, duties, and obligations, right? Private international law to the country refers to a set of the rules that determines uh, which jurisdiction will be comp uh, competent to hear a specific case, which law will be applicable uh, to govern the dispute when involving foreign elements, and how foreign judgment or arbitral award will be recognized and enforced. So those are the difference of substantive law and private international law. But this, um, when it comes to the soft law and hard law, uh, hard law uh, instruments, so hard law is the convention or international treaty that contracting parties to these treaties are obliged to directly apply or incorporate into their domestic law. Soft law, however, do not have legal binding force. They set up rules or standards in particular field of law, encouraging states to incorporate into their domestic law. Thus, they can be used to guide the reform or modification of domestic law. And depending on the nature of the soft law, they can also be applied or used as references by courts, uh, arbitrators, or interested parties. As we can see from this chart, here, the HCCH principles are a soft law instrument on private international law, dealing with the law applicable to a contract. Then the other three instruments, the CIC, the Limitation Convention, and the UNIDRA principles, they are substantive laws. The prescribed rules governs the terms and conditions of uh, contract dealings. Among these three instruments, the CISG and the Limitation Convention, as the name tells, they are the conventions, they are the hard law instruments, and the UNIDRA principles are soft law in nature. Now let's move on to HCCH principles. So what do the principles do? The principles are the first soft law instrument developed by the HCCH. The goal of the principles is to reinforce party autonomy meaning that the law chosen by the parties has the widest scope of application and should be respected by courts or tribunals as much as possible, of course, subject to clearly defined limits. The HCCH principles cover only when there is a choice of law chosen by the parties, agreed on by the parties. And the principles do not cover the situations where the parties do not agree on applicable law. So what do we need um, for the principles? So the advantage of a party autonomy are significant in international trade and investment. There is a need to encourage the widespread of this concept to the states that have not yet adopted this principle or to the states that have done so but with significant restrictions to the states that or, or to provide this um, development or refinement to the concept to the state that has already adopted this concept. Thus, the principles can be seen both as an illustration of how a comprehensive choice law regime for giving effect to the party autonomy may be constructed. It can also be used as a guide to best practice in establishing and refining such a regime. As we will be hearing later on in this lecture, the HCCH principles will also be useful for lawyers in drafting contracts and for the litigants um, in court or arbitrators in arbitration when they raise or decide a, a case. So the HCCH principles will be a useful source. So this sort of application of the, the principles, as I just said, 
while the aim of the principles is to promote the acceptance of party autonomy for choice flow, as we all understand, such a freedom should be limited, should have limit. Here, such limitations on party autonomy are provided under the principles. So the most important limitations, or in other words, the application of the party's choice should be limited through overriding mandatory rules and public policy of not only those from the forum, those of the states, but also includes those of the third state. So the purpose of those limitations is just to ensure that in certain circumstances, the party's choice law does not have the effect of excluding certain rules and policies that are of fundamental importance to states. Thank you, Ning. I have to say I have a real challenge. I have to introduce the CSG. And I have to say the CSG is often in itself the, the only topic of university courses. So it is the, taught in maybe 20 hours or more in, in, in a university. And now we have to come down to a few minutes. So I mentioned already, uh, CSG was uh, adopted in 1980, but it's actually the product of, of decades, literally decades of, of drafting that started actually uh, at UNIDRA. And then at some point uh, came to the United Nations and then as Anna will say uh, shortly, go, went back to UNIDRA for further, further elaboration. Um, and it was adopted uh, by uh, formal um, diplomatic conference uh, after uh, Ancitral uh, did uh, some work in finalizing the text. Now, uh, what's this in the CSG? The CSG is, of course, a, a, a long text, 101 articles. In its own ways, it's complex. It is divided in four parts, of which the first one is, is about general principles and its own scope of application. The second is about the formation of the contract, and the third is about the rights and obligations of the parties. And then, of course, there are the final clauses, like in every treaty. Now, one thing that is important, in my opinion, to stress is, yes, the, the CSG is the jewel of the crown. It's a substantive law, and it's hard law. But there is one thing that I will never forget, and it, it was a question that was asked to me for the first time by some Brazilian students when Brazil was adopting the CSG. It had to do with the hegemonic nature of the CSG. Unlike other treaties, the CSG is not a, a treaty that demands mandatorily its application. It's a default fallback treaty that applies only if the parties did not agree otherwise. It's really important to stress this. You mentioned Ning party autonomy. If you want, we can call it freedom of contract. But the core value of the CSG is freedom of contract. And in my opinion, the first contribution that the CSG gives a legal system or a jurisdiction where it is adopted, it is actually to reinforce the application of freedom of contract in international sales. Because then the parties are free to opt out or to vary any of its provisions, which is extremely important also in light of what Anna will say about the incorporation of contractual terms. Now, that being said, CSG applies, of course, uh, when uh, the parties to the contract have a place of business in contracting states, or when rules of private international law point at the law of a contracting state. Parties may opt out, but they have to do so explicitly, because uh, it is usually considered that the choice of the law of a contracting state includes the CSG because, of course, the CSG is the law of the state. And so it is enforced, it is just a separate and specialized set of rules for international sales. Obviously, the one advantage of the CSG is the fact that it has been uh, drafted for a long arm trade, which means that, for instance, one fundamental principle is the principle of the preservation of the effect of the contract. Because undoing contracts at a distance it's, is very costly. It means uh, sending back the goods, sending back payments, maybe incurring in, in multiple uh, currency exchange costs, and so on and so forth. So it is more efficient for the parties to try and preserve as much as possible the effects of the contract by adjusting it. 
And I believe that one of the great contributions that the CSG has done to the evolution of sales law is uh, to provide a coherent system of remedies that sees a number of tools uh, that can be used in order to bring back the economic balance in the performance of the contract in case there is partial performance. Of course, there are also cases where there is non-performance, and in that case, the CSG refers to the notion of fundamental breach and gives the possibility to avoid the contract. Now, more attentive, we will have uh, already noted that I use some terminology, which is unusual. Uh, when we speak English, we should maybe use the terminology of English as sales law. But uh, because the CSG is a uniform text, and it stands on its own, and it's not related to any legal tradition, it has its own terms, and it requires an autonomous interpretation in the light of its own principles. And there's also a gap filling mechanism, which is very important in the CSG. Of course, uh, this is uh, sometimes uh, not uh, uh, particularly easy to do. Uh, so uh, judges in particular have to be a little bit careful uh, when they interpret uh, the, the CSG, but obviously the guide is also meant to facilitate this kind of work of uh, uniform interpretation and application. At the same time, this has the huge advantage of putting all the parties on the same level of being available in the official languages of the United Nations and in many other languages, including case law, as we will see, and so, uh, and, and also to be very neutral and balanced between uh, buyer and seller. So all of these elements uh, are definitely very important. In practice, then, of course, uh, there will be at least references uh, to INCO terms uh, in the contract, so the INCO terms will complete. But in itself, the CSG has uh, already a comprehensive set of rules not only uh, for the formation of the contract, but also and especially for rights and obligations of the parties, and in particular, uh, what to do in case of partial performance and non-performance. Now, I always consider the CSG as the jewel of the crown, but the crown doesn't have a single jewel. There are multiple jewels, of course. Some of the jewels are not ancestral jewels, are jewels of Unidra or of the Hague Conference, but others are ancestral jewels. And historically, the CSG has been preceded by the Convention on the Limitation Period in the International Sale of Goods. The Limitation Convention, we call it, it has had less state participation than the CSG for different reasons, but it is a text of really excellent quality, and it really gets into the detail of a really complex matter. Now, here I will only say one thing. Limitation matters, that is to say, when, because of the passing of time, it is not possible to pursue a claim anymore, uh, be it uh, because uh, the action is not allowed or because the, the right uh, does not exist anymore, it depends on the national legal system. It's one of those very few matters where there is clearly professional diligence or negligence in case that uh, it, it can be uh, somehow related to, to, to the, what uh, the legal counsel did or didn't do. So I would flag this especially for audience uh, uh, interested in practical matters uh, because uh, this is really a delicate issue. On top of it, it's a matter that uh, has some significant difference between different legal systems, especially civil law and common law. And so I, I would say this convention is really quite useful and when it can be applied, it brings a lot of clarity. Uh, it has a lot of uh, detailed uh, rules, including on suspension or limitation, I will limit myself here to say that the, the standard the period for limitation is four years. And then, of course, there are ways to extend it. A footnote, because we live in the digital age, in the guide, you will find reference to other ancestral texts. Uh, they're also available on the ancestral website. But in particular, I would like to mention the United Nations Convention on the Use of Electronic Communications in International Contracts. It was really drafted uh, I would say with both eyes on the CSG, both in terms of structure and in terms of interaction, it can be particularly useful when uh, we have some form requirements, like for instance, the use of uh, writing or uh, the desire to sign 
not only contracts, but also communications during the performance of the contract. It's a um, comparatively new text. It was adopted in 2005. It's in force uh, in several states. It attracts regularly uh, new accessions. Uh, so I, I would uh, uh, invite also to look into that part of the guide and then, of course, to, to go further on the Anstral website. Thank you, Luca. So I'm encountering the same uh, challenge that you underlined, which is to introduce very few words, uh, the UNIDRA principles of international commercial contracts, which to use your terminology are one of the jewels of UNIDRA and generally speaking of the uniform law in international commercial contracts. Uh, UNIDRA principles are, and that was already underlined by Ning at the beginning, a non-binding codification of contract law rules and principles designed to be applied to commercial contracts globally. So they offer a typical example of soft law as opposed to CSG. Uh, they were developed by international working groups over the years that consisted of eminent contract lawyers from diverse jurisdictions, but acting in their personal capacity under the auspices of UNIDRA. And uh, we have to say that CSG is one of the main models for the UNIDRA principles. And many of the things that were mentioned by Luca in his uh, introduction to the CSG also apply in regard to the UNIDRA principles, which is important to underline. For example, the importance of party autonomy. Actually, what is the purpose of a soft law codification such as the UNIDRA principles? Their objective is to provide parties as well as adjudicators and other possible users, we'll go into this in one moment, with a set of balanced rules that are particularly well suited to cross-border transactions, not only because they are the result of comparative studies, but also because they were drafted taking into account the needs of international commerce, and we hope to be able to give some examples later on. And being a soft law instrument, they will only apply to a given contract if the parties or an adjudicator so chooses, and if such a choice is recognized or acknowledged by the legal framework. But on the plus side, they offer parties and adjudicators many different options as to their use. They're very flexible, and therefore, this is another facet of party autonomy that is fostered by a soft law set of rules that, such as the UNIDRA principles. It should be added, though, that the principles are a non-binding set of rules, but they can be used and have been used in practice also as models for national and international legislators. This is true also for the CSG which influenced uh, national laws. It's uh, true for the principles uh, also for more recent uh, codifications, such as, for example, the one in France uh, or the one in China, at least for certain parts of it. And uh, it is also true that an instrument such as a treaty, CSG, can be used by, part, by adjudicators, for example, as a soft law instrument. So they can be, uh, can be referred to by arbitrators as a set of rules that is applied just because they are considered to be good rules. So let's go back to the UNIDRA principles. The first edition was approved in 1994. We are now in the fourth edition, 2016, and this is it. Maybe you can see it. Now, the subsequent editions uh, did not really uh, purport to change the rules of the uh, previous editions, but they added further issues, and thus the coverage of the uh, principles was broadened. So what do they cover? In common with CSG, the uh, UNIDRA principles cover commercial contracts, and they cover international contracts. Commercial contracts, of, of course, means that consumer contracts are not included. But the UNIDRA principles have a broader scope of application than CSG because they apply to all international commercial contracts. And as far as their content is concerned, they uh, consist of a preamble uh, setting forth the ways the principles can be used. And 211 articles, it's very important to note that the articles are accompanied by comments and by illustrations. They are part and parcels of the instrument and they 
integrate and explain what the rules uh, mean, the articles mean. They cover the most important areas of contract law and the law of obligations uh, for those legal systems distinguishing between the two. So, of course, the part on formation, including pre-contractual phase, interpretation of the contract, which is a very important uh, chapter in the Unidraw principles, validity, illegality, performance, non-performance, and remedies, excuses for non-performance, hardship, agency, third-party rights, set-off, assignment of claims and transfer of obligations. There is also a part on limitation period, restitution, and special rules and comments regarding long-term contracts in the new editions. And finally, how can you use the UNIDRA principles, this soft law set of, of, of rules? Well, I, I usually uh, refer to them as a tool in the hands of parties and adjudicators. They are a tool of party autonomy because for, they can be used and they have been used in practice as guidelines for drafting international contracts. They have been chosen by parties of the law governing the contract, but as we will see also are the content of their contract, they are also a possible guideline to reach settlement agreements when something goes wrong. They are also a tool for adjudicators. Uh, they have been used by arbitral tribunals, particularly as the law governing the contract, or when parties refer to Lex Mercatoria, general principles of international commercial contracts without specifying what that meant. And when parties did not choose any applicable law, but it was clear that they meant to exclude the application of a specific domestic law. They have further been used to interpret international uniform instruments, including CSG, but also, and this is maybe a new uh, sector, which is particularly important, I hope to be able to say something about it at the end of the lecture, to interpret domestic law. When a domestic law is applicable, but there are certain issues in the interpretation of domestic law in its application to international commercial contracts. So for more information, of course, we all refer to the tripartite legal guide, which offers a wider description of the instruments themselves, and then of what we will be talking later on, which is uh, their uh, special points in their relationship. Thank you, Anna. Um, as we just heard, you know, the CISG and the UNIDRAP principles has been inspiring for each other, work together. Um, I just want to add that when the HCCH principles was adopted in 2015, and actually during all the negotiation stage, and the UNIDRA and the UNCITRA have been observers and being assisted in the development of uh, the HCCH principles. Of course, the HCCH principles, just like uh, similar to UNIDRA principles and the, uh, the CISD applies only to international commercial contracts, but the principles do not apply to consumer contracts or employment contracts because uh, consumers and employees are considered weaker party in the contractual relationships. So um, uh, I would just also advise you to, to study more about uh, the HCCH principles and, and from the legal guide. Now, I would like to move on to the next part of the, the, the lecture, um, talking about uh, interaction between the relevant instruments. When explaining this part, we took the approach to, uh, to use contracts, the life circle of a contract, to explain how our instruments will be relevant and how it will be used in each stage. So I would like to start with uh, the negotiation and drafting stage of the contract. So um, during the contract negotiation, it will not be the first thing, right, for the party to think about a dispute resolution mechanism or the law governing the contract. However, it's very important to incorporate or to agree on the choice of forum or choice of law during the contracting negotiation and drafting. And in practice, we know it is they are often called midnight clauses, right? Because lawyers will only start drafting the choice law and the choice of forum clause only when all other terms or conditions of contract are drafted. And 
often the occurred after the midnight. That's why we call these midnight clauses. But they are still important because they provide these clauses provide legal certainty and foreseeability in case a, a, a transaction goes bad and a dispute would need to be resolved. So these clauses, um, which could be located in the miscellaneous section of the contract or have their own sections, but they are indeed advised whether you are a transaction, uh, transaction lawyer drafting a, a contract or a litigator enforcing an agreement as their inclusion, as I just said, provide legal certainty and foreseeability. So what is a choice of law clause? So it just ensures the law of a chosen jurisdiction will govern the dispute, regardless where the dispute is decided. A forest selection clause or choice court clause, it sometimes use a different terminology, um, is a different sort of uh, provision or agreement. It only it sets the particular state or particular court or tribunal will, um, where the dispute will be decided. So when considering dispute resolution, you need to first consider, right, which mechanism the dispute should be resolved. Should it be arbitration or litigation, or even a combination of both? So both mechanisms have their pros and cons. Uh, I'm sure you have heard a lot, for example, of arbitration is generally considered expensive, or sometimes you say we heard the litigation is considered lengthy. Um, but I, I would like to mention that and in the litigation world, the, it's changing. So nowadays, the establishment of international commercial courts or tribunals in many jurisdictions across the globe gives the parties or the lawyers the options to go for litigation in the court which are specialized in international commerce and business. Okay, when choosing the litigation, it should also be considered whether this choice is exclusive or not. So, meaning whether the litigation should be handled solely in a specific state or a specific court. And such exclusive choice provides, of course, again, the um, predictability and the uniformity and the courts would tend to give more effect to such exclusive choice made by the parties. But parties can also make non-exclusive choice, choice court clauses. And the advantage of such clauses is provide flexibility. But of course, in practice, it may often raise jurisdiction challenges um, before the merits of the dispute are heard by the, case, by, by the court. And another thing I want to mention is that a forum selection clause, for example, even the exclusive choice court agreement can be avoided on the ground of it is against public policy. Um, when often when the lawyers um, making a dispute resolution planning or we call uh, planning of litigation strategy, they often need to consider the issue of recognition and enforcement of a potential judgment or arbitral award given by the court of arbitration tribunal. This will be relevant in the situation where the asset of the, your business counterpart, or we say defendant, is located in the country other than where the court is situated or the arbitration was held. So for these specific issues, there are international frameworks governing um, the recognition, the inf recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments or foreign arbitral award. So there are instruments such as the HCCH Convention on Church Court Agreement, uh, which uh, entered into force in October 2015 and have 32 uh, members. And we also have the HCCH Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Judgment, which was adopted in 2019, um, to be exact, 2nd July 2019. Um, there are also three signatories. So they are more interested to, uh, uh, towards the ratification. 
uh, towards ratification. Um, in the arbitration side, so there are also one 1958 New York Convention, who which deals with the recognition and enforcement of, of foreign arbitral awards. So now I move on to the choice of law clauses, which also known as governing law clauses. It allows the contract parties to choose the substantive law, substantive law to apply to the contract. This set of law covers negotiation, interpretation, performance of the contract. Um, party can choose one law governing the contract or different laws governing different parts of the contract. It is generally accepted practice. Um, it would not be surprising that you would probably prefer to choose a set of the rules or laws that are you are most familiar with or that you will be most beneficial to you. There are, however, several points um, when drafting choice law clause, I would like to um, probably put it here for your consideration. For example, when choosing the law, if you do not want to refer to the choice of law rules of certain jurisdiction, you may want to refer specifically to the substantive law or internal law of a particular jurisdiction, or there are other options, for example, we just heard from um, uh, from Luca, from Anna, CISG and Unidra principles are the options. Um, another point that um, uh, is when you choose a law, um, you should remember that in certain countries' law, you can only choose the law of the jurisdiction that has connection with the parties or the connection with the transaction. However, in other jurisdictions, such connection requirement is not required. So you can choose a law of the third state, which is also the principle of promoted under the HCCH principles. Um, uh, often choice law and choice forum are discussed together as they re reflect or build on the same goal, party autonomy, right? Uh, uh, freedom of contracts, for the sort of a freedom of contract. But they are different concepts covering different aspects of law. And um, such differentiation has been mentioned, for example, in the HCCH principles. It is emphasized that a forum selection clause itself is not a choice of law clause, but it may be one of the factors to be taken into consideration when determining whether the parties have intended to make the contract to be governed by the law of the forum. Um, generally speaking, parties would choose a state law, such as, I think, Paraguay law to govern the contract. But the principles, however, put forward a novel concept of choosing a non-state law to govern, to apply to the contract. Of course, non-state law should not be just a, a non-state law that's uh, available out there. Instead, the principles provide a definition. So non-state law should be generally accepted on an international, supranational, or regional level as a neutral and balanced set of the rules. In addition, the application of non-state law should be accepted by the law of the forum. So I would like to highlight here the CISG and the UNIDRA principles we have just discussed are typical examples of non-state law. And when considering these novel ideas of uh, choosing non-state law, it is perhaps more often um, to be accepted in arbitration setting in comparison with the court, uh, court litigations. But with the influence of the HCCH principles, many states such as Paraguay, or very recently in Uruguay, in the process of modernization of their internal laws, chosen non-state law is not accepted under these laws. This is a marvelous progress. As mentioned in my early uh, intervention, um, parties' choice law or party autonomy can still be limited, such as by the mechanism of rate overriding mandatory rules or by public policy of the court here in the case. We promote part of party autonomy and parties' choice law and parties' choice of forum need to be respected. Um, in other words, such agreement should be effective. So this is an important factor for international trade and business. But why? If parties' choice are effective and respected by courts, then parties know that and rely on such choice when a dispute arises. 
this will increase legal certainty and predictability for the parties in their contractual dealings, and as such, beneficial for the international trade and business as a whole. In this context, international framework in those aspects are needed and important. Thank you, Ning, for this very uh, detailed uh, explanation of issues of choice of law. I will just say two things. The first is uh, to reinforce what I said before, that uh, from a practical perspective, uh, choice of uh, the law of a jurisdiction where the CSG is in force without uh, explicit exclusion of the CSG normally means also a choice uh, for the application of the CSG. Uh, that is to say, the CSG is where the law of the country, it's in force in that country, and therefore uh, normally uh, will consider that the CSG applies unless uh, uh, the, the parties have explicitly opted out of the application of the CSG. Of course, like everything, there could be nuances, there could be uh, different uh, interpretations, there could be some, some cases uh, saying otherwise, but this is the main trend at the global level. The second thing that I would like to say as a main takeaway is that I would encourage those who have to do, uh, to deal with these issues on a practical level, to make sure that the three elements are uh, in sync. The choice of forum, the choice of law, and the actual content of the contract. Uh, because if uh, the uh, contract is negotiated, having in mind a certain legal system, but then because of uh, the bargaining, different bargaining power of the parties, another legal system is chosen in the choice of law, then probably a lot of the clauses of the contract will not make much sense anymore. So there should be uh, some consistency. And I am aware that this sounds like uh, contract drafting 101, but all of us who have a little bit of practical experience, even there is a contrast uh, and, and the party says, okay, one party chooses the forum and the other party chooses the law and then the two are actually not, not a, as aligned as it should be. And of course, disputes may occur and statistically will occur. This is particularly important. And I want to stress that when we're talking about parties in developing countries, and small and medium-sized enterprises, because these are typically disadvantages and they cannot impose their law as the applicable law. But uh, of course, all parties are equally entitled to know what is the content of the law, which law applies, so that they can conform to it when they perform. Because knowing the law means to be in a position to perform the contract properly. And performing the contract properly and in good faith is the most important step to prevent any possible dispute and which leads uh, inevitably to, to uh, a lot of time and a lot of money being spent while it could have been spent otherwise uh, producing uh, actual wealth. Yes, thank you, Luca, and thank you, Ning. Uh, I would like to very briefly touch upon one point, which will have, however, two different facets which is the issue of incorporating texts into the contracts. And I would like to explain what we mean by that. So on the one hand, I think Ning has already referred to the fact that uh, soft law, and in particular the unit of principles, can be chosen by the parties. And when they are chosen by the parties and the legal framework uh, allows it, then they will be considered the governing law of the contract. And this is particularly true for arbitration, but also in some legal systems when judges decide under their own legal system. But uh, there is also another possible use of uh, this set of rules, which is uh, uh, as models for the actual content of the contract, the contractual text of clauses, because of the fact that they are drafted as uh, quite detailed uh, rules. And this is also true for CSG, for example. And this is connected to party autonomy. Let me make just one example referring to the Unidra principles. Uh, chapter six uh, uh, deals with performance of the contract. There are a lot of default rules uh, on how performance is to be rendered. And if parties did not insert them in the contract and the UNDRA principles are applicable, then of course this default rule will apply. But they may also be looked at 
uh, as uh, models uh, for, to draft the contract, to remember that there are certain issues that are important. For example, the right to reject partial or earlier performance, or maybe payment modalities, currency of payment, the currency in which damages are to be assessed, and also the effects of public permission requirements, which is hardly covered by uh, domestic laws. If I may add the second facet, which is uh, another aspect of party autonomy and content of the contract, the legal guide underlines the fact that there are other organizations, and I think Luca also referred to this, developing clauses which can be used by parties because they will be incorporated in their contract to deal with specific issues. And CSG and the UNIDRA principles permit this. And in particular, this is true for the ICC clauses in terms that were uh, mentioned by Luca, shorthand clauses referring to a bundle of rights and duties of parties regarding delivery, costs related to it, and the passing of the risk, and they reflect the international uh, practice. So this is, again, another way that uh, uh, party autonomy can mould the contract in the case where specific uh, clauses might be considered useful by the parties. So maybe now we can pass to the further part of the lecture. I think we are nearing uh, the end of it, but we still have some important issues to cover. Thank you. We have now to make the final remarks. As you were speaking, of course, uh, we were all thinking of uh, recently issues with uh, partial performance, uh, hardship, and how different provisions in the CSG, in the UNIDRA principles, very detailed, but also, for instance, the ICC clause uh, can interact and how it is important uh, that uh, the practitioners are aware of uh, these different tools and how they can be used. In fact, uh, I would say, uh, to conclude, uh, uh, the guide, the uh, main goal is really to give easy access to all of this wealth of information. The three of us have been speaking for one hour, and we have only lightly scratched the surface of what we could uh, say and what we could discuss today. Uh, first of all, it's important to be aware that these uniform law instruments exist. I would like to stress that the uniform law is an additional tool in the box of the specialist. Uniform law does not replace national law unless it is advantageous for the parties to do so. But at the same time, we have also to dismiss uh, the attitude, the traditional attitude of uh, especially practitioners who are familiar with what they know and they don't want to accept the challenge and learn what they don't know and get out of the comfort zone of national law in order to see if their clients would, uh, would be better off by using uniform instruments. Uniform instruments are neutral, are fair, are balanced. They help in establishing trust between the parties. We live in a globalized economy. We live on seemingly endless transnational supply chains. It's much better if we have the same law that applies to the different steps of the supply chain than if we have a fragmentation of national laws and dispute resolution methods. So first of all, to know that these uh, instruments exist, to know what is in there, and also to promote their uniform application because there is no point in using a uniform text if besides the uniform statute, we don't have also the uniform interpretation and the uniform outcome. So that a case that is litigated in Paraguay or is litigated in Uganda or is litigated in Vietnam would lead to the same result. Um, obviously, uh, capacity building is endless. It's, it's by definition continuing education of practitioners, of course, also of judges, of course, also of, of uh, uh, law professors. Actually, I would like to stress that uh, uh, education in the university is the first step. And in this respect, uh, we have an incredibly powerful tool, which is the tool of the moot courts. 
this all started actually also here in Vienna with the uh, William Wyss Moot Court. And, and now there are moot courts everywhere and they, they all use arbitration and CSG. And so we have thousands of students who have been, uh, uh, who have enrolled uh, in the cause of the CSG and now they are the best uh, uh, promoters uh, of the convention and of the other uniform control law text. And my final consideration, and of course, uh, I invite you, Anna and Ming, uh, to, to, to make further comments. It, it builds on what Anna already said. These texts are not only for international uh, trade. They are designed for international trade. They have a uniform nature, but they're increasingly influencing the evolution of national law. Uh, the UNIDRA principles, uh, the CSG itself, and the, the Hague principles lately, uh, as Ning said, uh, they were incorporated in Paraguay and Uruguay. So in that respect, uh, um, Latin America is leading. I would like to mention also very important, there is a guide that is complementary to the tripartite guide, which was written by the Organization of American States. So that one gives uh, the regional uh, uh, perspective. Uh, and it was also actually drafted uh, having in mind the uniform law in particular and a lot of private international law considerations. Uh, so all of these things are, are, are really important. Uh, we have now many more tools that we had a few years ago and we are in a position to understand these tools better. But also when we transpose these uniform uh, law provisions in national law, it's really important to know where they come from and what they aim at so that it is possible to maintain the same spirit and to understand their function. And I would say this is also very true uh, for, for uh, digital trade and for all that has to do with uh, electronic transactions and other things where Ancitral is very active. Okay, thank you, Luca. So just to complement what you have just said, uh, I will refer to the well, another possible use of uh, uniform law uh, which is uh, not the, the classic use uh, when an international commercial contract uh, is uh, uh, drafted or is adjudicated. Um, adjudicators, for example, have used in practice uh, the UNIDRA principles to uh, interpret the otherwise applicable domestic law. So a domestic law is applicable to a contract and the contract might even not be an international contract. But uh, in order to determine the meaning of rules and concepts of that national contract, which uh, are in, uh, in flux because there are different interpretations, some of them considered to be more uh, suitable to commercial contracts, some others more traditional, then uh, adjudicators, uh, uh, particularly also judges, uh, have referred to the UNIDRA principles uh, to foster the interpretation that they thought was uh, the one uh, more conducive to uh, uh, modern development of their own domestic uh, laws. Of course, uh, all within the rules and principles of interpretation of that particular legal regime. And there are numerous practical examples of this from the remedies, for example, the requirements for the termination of the contract that also uh, Luca referred to, or uh, to the rules of interpretation of the contract. And if you allow me to do so because of the context uh, where we are speaking, there is a very recent volume of the International Association of Comparative Law edited by Alejandro Garro and Jose Moreno, which deals particularly with this issue of the application of the UNIDRA principles as a tool to interpret domestic law. So just to conclude, uniform law is not a panacea. I think Luca made it very clear and also Ning. It, uh, it is a tool. It is something that uh, it's very important that practitioners and future practitioners uh, no, in order to have a further weapon, in a way, in their hands and to be able to advise uh, parties in drafting contracts and also to act accordingly when there is a dispute and when a dispute is adjudicated. So over to you, Ning, for the final remarks. 
Uh, thank you, Anna. Thank you, Luca. Um, I couldn't agree more with what you said about the uniform law. Indeed, as you uh, both mentioned, that we, we, there, there is a need to for the promotion, promotion the uniform law, and especially the concept we are talking about here today is freedom of the contract. So um, if you allow me to refer back to the work of the Hague Conference, the HCCH, you know, we, we have the instruments um, on the party's choice law. We have the instrument on party's choice court. So how we deal with that, whether it's a soft law instrument or hard law instrument. So, but there are still occasions, there are situations that parties could not agree on the applicable law or choice forum, all such choices are not valid. So what to do with this situation? Because there are still um, no uniform instrument, there's no treaties of soft law in this respect at the international level. I'm talking about at the international level. So there's still work to be done. And if there's absence of the party's choice, choice of law, which law should be applicable law. So if the party did not uh, choose a, a court, so what will be the, the jurisdiction rules that the court can rely on to establish a jurisdiction? Uh, there's still much work to be done in the field of jurisdiction and the applicable law. So what we think together with the uh, sister organizations and probably with uh, all the students here today, we need to not only the capacity building with all of you, it's also that we can work together further to promote party autonomy, promote the freedom of contract, to uphold the party's wishes and the international commercial contracts. And then there are still much work to be done and we will do it together. So I think that's my conclusion and the lecture of today. Thank you. And thank you to the organizers for having yes, us thank here. You. It's no, a pleasure. great pleasure to be here. And thank you to the students for the patience in listening to us, hoping to see them in person sometime, somewhere. Thanks. Thanks also on my side. <laughs>